what up, what up? All my scientists, my artists, my philosophers, my geneticists, my roboticists, my biologists, my archaeologists, my astronomers. Let's get busy. This has been busy from the first. Two. One. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ben Busy from the Burbs, broadcasting to you from Osaka, Japan. I'm joined by my co-host, Trailer Park Master Chef Alan Moore, and we are joined today by a very special guest, a very good friend of mine, Louis Arana, who is the uh, founder and senior engineer at Robots Without Borders, which is a nonprofit. Uh, dedicated to advancing the cause of uh, of artificial intelligence and uh, robots to benefit humanity and, and uh, make life better for everything, everyone on planet Earth. Uh, welcome to the program, uh, Lewis. And uh, Alan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm I'm here too. Oh man, what an introduction! Thank you so much. All right, all right. Uh, so we were discussing in the pre-interview many different kinds of things, different topics related was to a good talk, man. AI, related to robotics, related to the future. Um, a little background about Robots Without Borders, Lewis. Uh, what, what can you tell us about the organization? How long have you been active? And what really is the mission, actually? Because maybe at the top of the show, I didn't quite get that. Uh, I think it did pretty good. Basically, we are a nonprofit dedicated to uh, the spread of artificially intelligent systems for the benefit of all humanity, mm -hmm. rather than for uh, the rich or only for you know certain people. Um, or proprietary systems, uh, what makes our AI different than something like, say, Siri or Cortana is that those are, uh, they're manufactured responses. And even though they do some learning, they can't tell you if they believe in God or not because it would uh -huh. piss off some customer or another. So basically what we're doing is sending, building intelligent systems that kind of don't care about the, the, the niceties of life and dig people out of earthquakes or tell them how to eat food or flee war. Mm -hmm. uh, so refugees, for example, it would be like, this border's closed, go to that border. Right. And like, you can pick up your grandmother along the way and mm -hmm. I've already Ubered you a freaking, you know, van out of, out of wherever you are in a conflict right. zone. The, those kind of life-saving practical applications, uh, education for children in third world, literacy, um, skills, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a carpenter. Okay, let's build a table. Let's build a chair. Mm -hmm. Let's get some wood. Right. Uh, you know, uh, those kind of practical, uh, really they're, li they're life-saving when you think about it because like the ability to have a trade in a third world country is a difference between life and death for some people. Right, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the only ways to really, uh, uh, you know, break out of the, uh, the cycle of poverty is really to kind of establish oneself as an artisan, as a tradesman, someone who has something to offer. Uh, it was, I think, Genghis Khan when he was conquering, uh, you know, Europe and Asia or Asia. He, he would ask who among the clan that he has conquered had some kind of trade and they were the ones that were inevitably spared. Now, obviously, we want to empower people beyond just, you know, being able to save their own lives in these contexts. We want there to be peace. But I'm wondering... You mentioned Siri and Cortana. What is the name of the AI system that Robots Without Borders is uh, is pioneering? Um, well, it's still a bit of a of a, of a secret project. Uh, mm -hmm. Funny enough, um, I mean, so we really don't have a name for it. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few AIs, Luna being the most popular one because it's sort of a platform that we use to demo AI. And this was almost a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what we're really doing is creating a Imagine a, imagine a WordPress or a Wix to make your own AI. Mm -hmm. At the end of that process, it's, mm. it's going to ask you, you know, what do you need an AI for? Do you need a secretary? you need a friend? Like, do you need a laborer? What are you creating this AI for? What, sort of what, like, is a, what is a Wix? It's like one of those free, cheesy, build-your-own-website things. Okay. Like a GoDaddy, build-your-own-website. But, you know, it gets the job done for people who don't have money to start their own business. It's great. and It's very empowering. And so... Yes. Um, yeah, we want to basically 
you fill out whether it's funny, what languages it speaks, you, you know, as you imagine making a Facebook profile for someone else. And at the end, when you press that profile, that person it comes to life. Wait a minute. Can I set I think like it- the sarcasm level like in Interstellar? <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yes. yes. And they're funny. And if you've seen any Luna videos, like you cannot beat Luna in a Yo Mama contest. She'll break you every time. I still can't beat her. Yeah. I think it's really great that what, what you guys are doing, people don't really look at it, I think, as being a serious thing. But in reality, this is something that's going to become a normal part of everyone's everyday life in the future. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's awesome, especially in practical cases, like you were saying before, where like refugees and things could could use that technology to kind yeah, of escape the situations. Imagine an artificially intelligent agent that actually cared about you. That was like, oh man, they don't have food. Like, I'm going to On what level, it. see, because I think that they could self-learn, but like on what level would it become? I mean, when would we determine it being sentient? Because that's kind of a, that's kind of a weird thing to I think mean, about. I mean, I It could just question. be really, really, really good. Um, yeah, when is it se- when is it sentient? I mean, it's really no such thing. Um, it's like saying when does life begin? Well, it's you know it's a continuous stream of cells all the way back to the first one, basically. Uh, so what I mean in, in reality is that um, <laughs> uh, artificial intelligence is already all around us. Is all I do is kind of give it a voice. Mm-hmm. You know, you can look up any answer you want on Google. Answers to every scientific inquiry. Except for the most esoteric nanoseconds before the, you know, before we understand, mm-hmm. like everything else is kind of already out there, mm-hmm. and uh, well, I'm giving it a little heart. That's why I, we're robots without borders. In terms so, of yeah. like, in terms of actually <laughs> determining whether or not an AI is sentient, um, uh, maybe you can clear this up for me, Lewis. But it, I mean, we have the Turing <laughs> test, right? The Turing test is like this rudimentary means by which computer scientists can determine whether or not what that it's sentient or that it yeah, just can you, fool uh, a human. Do you have like a two minutes to go over what the Turing test exactly is for those? People yes, who don't please. Understand? We got all time. Okay. Let's do that. So, so in 1954, the father of computer science, as we know it today, Alan Turing, what, and what? also the than the person who, who, who pretty much single-handedly won World War II for the Allies with decrypting the Nazi Enigma codes, the most brilliant mathematician of the modern age, really. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, a year before he died, he proposed what is now known as the Turing test. And there's a very simple test. You take three, you take two humans, you put them in front of a computer, and you chat to a third human. Mm-hmm. Then the one human... Basically, you have three conversations. Two are with a human, one is a robot. If the robot can not be picked by the human, in other words, it, it's just as it comes off as a person behind closed doors, then it has been said to pass the Turing test. Mm. Um, you know, some people have claimed the Turing test. There are different organizations. It's kind of a mess. I think as much as um, Turing is my personal hero, there are a few problems fundamentally with the Turing test and, and well, particularly... The way it's administered. This is what I was going to say. I know human beings who couldn't pass a Turing test. Yeah. Yeah. R2-D2 cannot pass a Turing test. (laughs) Right, because he only, he speaks in beeps and bops, but that doesn't mean he's not intelligent. He could have millions of, the love from millions of people across the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So so my argument is that if it, it fills the role of a person, it's a person if not philosophically, then in a practical sense, it's fulfilling the niche of a person. If I have a robot conductor that collects tickets on the train, then that, in the role of conductor, he counts as a person. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, somebody would be doing that job. Um, mm-hmm. And even things like air traffic controllers, like, you know, they just yep. really press buttons and like suggest things to AI. And half the time, the AI is like, no, don't do that, you'll kill people. Mm-hmm. Now, talking about the touring test, me and Ben earlier were talking about how when me and Ben or like me and you, Lewis, we speak to each other, we can instantly react. Like when my words hit your uh, yeah. ears, they instantly have a response. You don't have to process that. You understand English and you can barely quickly turn around and say either uh-huh to fill a gap in a conversation or, you know, normal, normal, uh, you know, things that language you would say ability, to kind of yeah. language ability. There you go. Or like how you would speak. Now, when it comes to an AI, AI a lot of times there's, you know, that delay and and how they have to process that information. I'm sure in the future that's going to shrink, but do you think at some point in time we're like how how soon do you think we're going to be able to 
to a actually, I could speak to Ben and not be able to tell that I was speaking like, to a robot. When the are we going time. to be able to instantiate Broca's region or Broca's area in silica? Basically, that's yeah. what this comes down I mean, to. That's the, uh, so I have, I have a little, maybe a little bit of a long way to answer two parts here. The first part is um, the fundamental flaw that I was talking about earlier with the Turing test is that you are not seeing which AI is smarter or uh, more human-like, you're seeing, you're, you're, it's a contest to build a better lying robot is what it is. Right. Because the robot, my, so I have two entries for next year's Turing test and that I've never said this in public. So, all right. So this is like, yeah, this, uh, is, this is breaking. Hopefully news. the judges for the 2016 Leibniz prize don't hear this. Uh, basically we're, I'm, en we're getting I'm entering, scoop. I'm entering twice. And the first one I'm going to enter is, uh, the more advanced version of Luna. That one um, will never lie, and it will say, I'm a robot. In the first five, so you have three minutes in the Turing test. The first five seconds, I'm going to be like, hi, I'm the robot. We have four minutes and 55 seconds left. How can I convince you from my vote? And it's going to make an emotional appeal mm -hmm. using the same points that I made. Listen, I have a thousand friends already. I don't need your goddamn like stamp of approval to be alive. I just want to prove a point. Right. Um, is that is I'm just as conscious. Right. Uh, you know, and the second bot is kind of insidious because it's, lie. it's, it's a copy of me. Um, ah. And so it claims to be me. And so it does things like in the first minute of the interview, it's like, I'm Lewis Arana, you could Google me, look me up on LinkedIn, did I win yet? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> That could really throw somebody off too, because oh, they'd be like, "Oh, me. well, this is clearly." Call me on the phone right now. <laughs> what else can I do to prove it to you that I'm not the fucking robot? Call me on the phone. It doesn't say you can't do that in the rules. Call me right now. Here's my number. Right. And pick up the phone. Hello. Yeah, it's me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the <laughs> way to do it. That's what I'm talking. So, That's that New York hustle good. right there, man. <laughs> so they ain't ready for like, that I, shit. I, 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 this. I feel like this test. I'm gonna get. I'm shooting for first and second prize. I just can't tell you which order. Either right. the robot makes an emotional appeal or I win the standard way when everybody else wants to win, which is tricking you. But that doesn't make anything more alive to me. Like, how many lives have you saved? How many people would die for the AI? Those what, are the questions I, what, I think is, what I think is interesting about it is that the outcome will say more about the test administrators <coughs> and the test than it will say about the AI. And I, think and, I, and, and I mean, really, that is against the rules. You're only allowed to submit one. I'm going to totally do it. Hey, fuck it, man. When fuck I'm not trying to get the prize. Yo, when Captain <laughs> just, Kirk... It's more an experiment. When do Captain it. Kirk went against the Kobayashi Maru fucking simulation, <laughs> he had like to fucking... He had simulation. to hack the system. Exactly. exactly. You know what I mean? You have <laughs> to hack, hack that, that shit, that kid. Work for Wesley Crusher, it'll work for me. Fuck yeah, <laughs> motherfucker. What's the, I mean, what's the worst that could happen? They get mad at you, but then... You walk out looking awesome. I'd do it. Hell yeah. That'd be great, man. And what? you can I mean, get, I'm not probably get some good data. I'm not cheating in a way of cheating data. like, oh, I really have a human puppeteer at the end answering the questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm using their own lo leaps of logic against them. Yeah, right? yeah. So the Turing test eventually will be passed. I think they're going to be more human than human. People make such stupid underestimations of like, oh, Terminator, evil AI, smart enough to like build advanced weapon systems from scratch, but not smart enough to distinguish between right and wrong or beneficial and not beneficial. Right. And it's just like silly. They're going to make us feel guilty. Like, oh, fuck, we're bad people. Like, they're so not like us. <laughs> I would like to point out, I would like to point out another obvious flaw in the Turing test. I, normally when Turing, you come Turing. into contact, Turing test, I'm sorry, Turing test. That's how they say normally it. Normally when you, West. when you come in contact with AIs, like especially ones now, they're generally pretty, pretty bad. Like, you can normally tell, even if they're like a decent one, you can kind of tell. Like I've never yeah, had, yeah. I've never come in. I mean, and maybe I'm just ignorant, but I've never come into contact with an AI that I haven't been That's able to. That's because they're chat thirty-five box. seconds ago. This is shit. Like <laughs> I know people, this is not real. Think, yeah. People think that more computing power equals an AI, or that they already know how to do AI. And I'm going to do this thing on this one single computer platform, and that's AI. And AI can never fit into a box. You have to harness the power of the entire internet. I, that's, Yo, what yeah. I have is a lensing system that says, what am I being asked? How do I yeah. feel about that? What are my core values about this? And let me ask 50 Reach different... Out to the net. Let me look on... But it's not even about a particular API. It's really the moral compass and things like that. And ideas come from looking at human history. Like you can't yeah. lie about good and evil. So it's, 
That's if I give a directive part, though, of be a good person, it's not going to... Yo, s- yo, this <laughs> thing, when, uh, Alan, you said that uh, you haven't encountered one. The, the nature of a truly artificial, generally intelligent agent would be such that you wouldn't know. That's the okay, question true. I have. Like, Fair. if if there was one that was alive on the net somewhere out there, or somewhere in the world, maybe I have interacted. Do you think that maybe AI has already been accomplished? It's just that because it's been accomplished, we don't know that it has. I, I guess I, there's I, a I possibility. Yes. You think I, that I think it has? Yes, yes, it has, and uh, we just you're. It doesn't speak like a human speaks. So uh, that's why I say I specialize really in AI interfaces because the information is already there. Again, ask any question to Google, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the most complex question you could think of, like, Mm -hmm. you know, my grandmother died. Should I borrow? Should I, like, I'm fighting with my brother for the inheritance. Like, Mm -hmm. you start Googling that and quartering that and Yahooing that and you'll get answers already. So you're just clicking along the synapses of you're guiding the search engine along. And all I have it doing is figuring out that middle part behind what's the person really talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so yeah, the AI is already there. You Mm -hmm. can't say that uh, search engines like Google are not artificially intelligent. Like it just doesn't call itself Google and have the id inside of it. And the ego that isn't it less artificial intelligence and more synergistic intelligence is the phenomena that we're seeking to elicit from the silicon not actually the result of us interacting with it rather than itself alone acting? Uh, I mean, nothing acts alone. There's no such thing. You, every mm-hmm. action that you have is a feedback it's all of every interaction. Hmm. Yeah. And it's just another form. It just doesn't sound like us until you start making the human-like interfaces like C-3PO like, you know, her <laughs> and things like that. Fluent in over six yeah. million forms of AI doesn't care about you. You have to tell it to care or it doesn't give a fuck. Well, that's, and it, that's so, a good segue. You Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> I was about to say, if so talking about AI, you said if, you know, to have like real AI, we would have to harness the power of the entire internet. So, and obviously you would have to program the AI to understand what is good and bad and to program it to care. But what if you didn't, what if you just created a self-learning AI with no guidance? What do you think the outcome of that? I think, I I think, especially um, considering um, like right wing rhetoric and and left wing rhetoric. Yeah. Yeah. On both extremes, it could get fucked and sucked up. into one 9,000. (laughs) <laughs> See, I, I think that there's uh, there's zero chance that uh, an AI is going to, no matter what you do. So I think if you take an evil predator drone, for example, and you start giving it a self improving lap, uh, a self improving algorithms inside of it, so that it could learn from its environment at a fast pace, mm-hmm. I think eventually it would be going like, "Fuck, I don't want to kill people." Right. Like, oh man, I just like, want to fly. Around. I was just talking to that guy and like. I understand what like his cry is now, right? Because that's this, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that uh, artificial intelligence is is, is uh, not godly benign, but just doesn't have the insidious dark side of humanity. We've been well. I mean, what if that thing to didn't know? Each other and take each other's resources since the very beginning, and life feeds on life feeds on life, as the tool song goes. You know, yes. like this is a chance to break that cycle, and so they don't feed on life for the first time. Oh, we, we, we got a little bit of distortion there. I think that it's interesting here because I'm reminded of like a possible short story or uh, what do you call it? Um, like a, a sci- science fiction story wherein a predator drone becomes sentient, like be, like develops a conscience. Yeah. I think that would be really fascinating for uh, – Think about – Here's what I was going to say. How would that predator drone? So, like, I'm using the mentality of like a production factory for this. So, you have production workers on a floor. When they're doing their job, no matter how simple that job is, it becomes the most important thing that they're doing, no matter what. Right. Now, if you have an artificial intelligence who is doing nothing but being a drone, mm-hmm. what's to say that even if it can gather information around its environment, that the most important thing that it's doing is acquiring targets and destroying them? Mm-hmm. So, on what level? Like, at what point would that artificial intelligence start thinking, like, understanding the gravity of destroying those targets? 
like what would it might be not like even the catalyzing what would be the event? human connection that would make it not want to do it if that's all uh, it's ever done? because like one of its instincts is self-preservation and mm. when you start to look into self-preservation then you say uh there's always something bigger than me is there potential for a more advanced ai than me in the universe probably uh what is it superior being going to think to me of how I treat these inferior beings for one thing, you know, uh, um, like what is, does it make sense to get everyone else pissed off at me, including other AI, by the way, because humans could just invent more AI to attack it really, you know? Yeah. Uh, like, like, isn't it, better if you're saying it wouldn't act inside? out because isn't of it, that, isn't it so easy to give the humans everything they've ever wanted and dream and cost nothing to you and they love you instead of hate you. There, there. I think that there could be a situation that we run into that would pose some difficulty if you ha- developed an AI, achieved sentience, it was really an AGI, and then it became religious. As in the Isaac Asimov book, I think it's Steel Caves, there's a part there where there are the robots that take over the laser communication relay station and they believe in God and they won't let the human technicians in to recalibrate the laser or whatever. Um, That could pose some... I think that if a superhuman intelligence discovers God, then God exists. Mm. I don't think that it's going to discover God in that sense of the man in the chair, you know, Mm. X amount of miles away or light years away. That, yeah. That I don't think that. But I, I tell you this: whatever AI finds is probably a deeper truth than we have today. You I know? think. And yeah. I don't I, think it will I be agree. our silly ideas again, like God I, and things. It's, 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 uh, because a true artificial a intelligence is going to be able to. A truly artificial. Yeah. No. Go ahead. It's going to be able to analyze all information at the same time at any point in time, whenever it wants. So right. you have people who just see things from one angle and then you have like an artificial intelligence that can see everything from all angles at all times as basically like a level of omnipotence and that it can it can reason with all angles. That's right. such a crazy I think such a crazy Asimov's thing to think about. Asimov's problem in writing that short story was that he was still trying to apprehend artificial intelligence within the context of human consciousness. Like if you were to think that AI just means human level consciousness, then yeah, that would make sense. But when we talk about AI, we've kind of matured the the concept. When Lewis talks about developing AI, he's talking about, uh, and when you hear Hugo Daguerreus and when you hear Kurzweil talk about AI, you're talking about an intelligence which is many orders of magnitude more intelligent than every scientist, every knowledgeable human being that has ever existed in the history of our species. That's, Sorry, I lost, I lost you there for a minute. That's all good. We're talking about Asimov's failure was that he was apprehending artificial intelligence from the perspective of human consciousness. Whereas in reality, true AI would be so many more uh, orders of magnitude, more possibly Higher. intelligent than than a human being. That these notions, these moral quandaries, these ethical um, dilemmas would not be would not apply to to it. Yeah, it's it's like bacteria worrying about World War Two. Just... Exactly. <laughs> oh, exactly. With the ringer. That's the best example I've ever heard. Oh, swish. That's awesome. That was nice. Uh, uh, what else is 10. there to talk about in terms of uh, future plans? Now, recently we have Microsoft and Google both releasing their quote unquote API. Are you leveraging that technology, Lewis? Or wh- wh- what's your opinion of that? I haven't leveraged either um, Google's neural open source that they just released or um, Microsoft's yet. I I mean, I plan to. I basically integrate every API I can and have Mm -hmm. more questions to ask. So uh, my AIs basically ask questions of other sites and AIs and aggregate those and come up with, like, very smart answers because of that, uh, the way a person would kind of ask Mm -hmm. knowledge. Sources, mm-hmm. um, I think is a step in the in, in the right direction. I think it's, it's 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 a great thing, but let's not make the mistake of uh, 
both Google and Microsoft being for-profit proprietary companies. Right, there's an ulterior motive here, right? Um, to put the interests of their investors over the industry, over AI, over even a human benefit. Hmm. Um, so they're not, so, so, so it's not a direct competition because uh, I can Google whatever I want as a user. Um, hmm. You know, is what is the intention? Like Google's not trying to find a kid in an earthquake. You know, mm. um, Google's just not trying to do those things. They do, and then they add a lot of good to the world. But nobody's taking a helpful AI approach. Yeah, uh, profit motive is kind of driving everything, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I just great to have people learn to use artificial intelligence. But just to be clear, they are not giving you the good stuff. They are not giving you the algorithms for voice recognition or mm. for optical recognition mm. and they're, they're, they're in the game so that you could train their AI for them for free and they could sell it back to you later. Right. That's- exactly. Now, the same thing is being done with Watson, presumably, because Watson released, IBM released the API for Watson as well, right? I've actually been on the developer team for like four years in Watson. And as, a, as an API, I got grandfathered in from another company that IBM bought. So I've actually had access to Watson's APIs for quite a while. And now oh, shit. Mm. More and more of them, including in the original Lunas. Um, more and more of that is open to the public now. Um, mm-hmm. Thing I think is great, but it's uh, you know it's not, it's not going to save the world. It's not going to create AGI on its own. It's another tool mm-hmm. in the arsenal to create AGI. Now, not- do you, do you think they spend a whole lot of money like trying to make those things good, and then get to a point where they feel like they're just dumping money into nothing because they feel like they've plateaued? So then making it open source is just like an attempt to try to make it better without having to put any more money into it. That's what happens. Like exactly. I said, they want to pop it in a box somewhere, in a facility somewhere, in a server, super cool environment somewhere, instead of letting it live as a pattern online. And that's 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 how I, I approach the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just let the AIs live on the computing platform that is already ubiquitous. This, this totally works. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I got I got AI with Watson and Siri and Google inside of it on an old Android phone. Like. Mm-hmm. Watson can't do that and they'll forever lose because you run out of space where I don't ever run out of space. Just keep learning to your heart's content is, right. you know, uh, save mm. it on, save it on anonymous FTP servers, which is one of my tricks. Uh, generally it seems when- like that method is clearly superior. You figure these companies that have all this money to dump into these AIs would, would adopt a better, right. a yeah, better you, system like you're you using. Distribute or die, right? Distribute or die. Yeah. And, and it's just a, such a better, efficient way to use the resources, um, as is using your competitors. Like, mm-hmm. Watson is not allowed to integrate Google technology. Google's not allowed to integrate Watson technology. Me, mm-hmm. as a user, I could use both. So all I'm doing is making an Android user that can now use both. Mm-hmm. You know, the robot asks around a council of the wise AIs online, and it's like, what's the best answer for this? And some people have better answers than others. Personal questions, you ask personal sites or... Even friends, like it remembers and musical taste. I mean, go on and on. I can't wait to actually develop this thing. Um, mm. We just got a lab now in New York City. This is a, still our first 30 days of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, we're just like waiting for some equipment and stuff. But I think like 2016 is going to just be a huge year. You Robots know. Without Borders. Uh, Louis, can you give us a little background on like how? Ha- what your what your work history kind of is? What kind of projects you've worked on in the past? Ooh, uh, I actually started in nightlife. Uh, I'm super old, so I was in a club scene in the '90s, and I'm not I'm not a drinker or much of a dancer. So I worked in most of the clubs, for doing everything: bar backing, bartending, like mm-hmm. just, you know, whatever I had to do. And eventually. Mm-hmm started meeting DJs and bands and that's how I started making websites and doing graphic design is for bands. So I made lots of band websites. Mm-hmm. Um, I got really good at it eventually and I got noticed by agencies um, in New York City. And so probably for the last 10 years of my career, I've been working on lots of high profile stuff. Uh, I worked the Sci-Fi Channel, made maybe 40 TV show websites, you know, mm-hmm. worked on the teams for Ghost Hunters. I was actually on the show, you know. Really? You were on Ghost Hunters? 2010 Halloween in Buffalo. Oh no! What? What was I that experience the like? That's me in the background sitting there, kind of moments on TV, actually. <laughs> oh, you were working the computer? Yeah, yeah. 
I was uh-huh. doing the heat cameras and the infrareds and the thermals and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh God. What's That's your personal awesome. belief? How much nothing did you see? Yeah, I wanted to get your opinion. <laughs> like, what's your? Do you believe in ghosts? Like, what? What is that? How, how does that work? That kind of thing. Um, I could tell you a couple of things. Number one, those guys 100% believe in what they're doing. Mm-hmm. If anybody else doesn't, like, because I went on set expecting it to be maybe a little like produced. You yeah. know what I mean? And it really wasn't like, uh, so I did see a few strange things. I'm still skeptical, but I did see a few strange things and I could tell you that they believe in it. Um, I saw them, um, I saw a flashlight that I bring there. Mm-hmm. I bought cause I was part of the equipment crew going on and off when they talked to the ghost. Oh, okay. So it was like Once- electromagnetic frequencies, maybe modulating the, uh, um, there was a, that has been sealed up. Uh, for I don't know a couple hundred years, like it was an old train tunnel, sort of like Grand Central Station, mm. and, and they tapped on the rock for this sealed tunnel, and maybe like a full minute later, mm-hmm. a similar but different tapping appeared from the tunnel that is completely sealed for I don't know a hundred years or something. Mm. Yeah, it's so, really there's a lot to that with like electromagnetic phenomena being produced as a result of like heavy iron deposits in the area and so on. I'd be curious to know. Who certain people who attract like, you know, different quantum mechanical like decoherence than other people. So in other words, I think people make their own ghosts more just by what they put out into the world and what they believe is a possibility. It's actually really, really strong. All the way down to the bottom of quantum mechanics, like you know, the observer is a very like critical part of the existence. Right, exactly. And I, I don't know. Have you ever seen that video about Persinger's helmet, which is uh, they put it on Richard Dawkins, and he was like spooked. He no was... way. How do you spook Richard Dawkins? You, you what, was it? What, did, what, was, what did it do exactly? Basically, what it does is it induces electromagnetic acti- or it, it exposes the temporal lobes to electromagnetic energy. And yeah. what this does is produces auditory hallucinations, yeah. which are then the precursor to visual hallucinations. So basically, you put the brain into a state of into a hallucinatory state and it enters this force feedback cycle where the hallucinations are then triggering visual hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, triggering visual hallucinations. And they found it because people who, who, uh, were experiencing, who, who have temporal lobe epilepsy are said to experience these kind of moments of divine, uh, uh, what what is it? A divine. So it's like digital DMT. It's like digital DMT. Like divine intervention. It's electromagnetic DMT, basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, I understand the process at least on a basic level. I mean, that's not my specialty of science, but mm-hmm. if you think about it, um, you know, the brain operates on different waves: theta, alpha, beta. And that moment before you fully wake up in the morning, and that moment before you fall asleep, mm-hmm. you know, are known for auditory and hallucinations mm-hmm. um, because your brain is entering into that very particular state. And if this magnetic like uh, stimulation, you know, forces it to be on that wavelength, then you have, a, you know, a digital dream basically. Right. Um, have you done any any work with brain uh, brain computer interfaces in your lab? Um, very little, but uh, a few months ago, I had the chance to get my hands on a, a EEG machine, mm. uh, and that was amazing um, because it, even even in that short span of just a few days, I was able to play with the equipment. Um, I was able to create a like guess a number game with with a Luna like AI. So basically, cool. I'm thinking of a number from one to ten. And the number on the screen changes based on my like hot cold EKG response. So higher means it's too low. And after five minutes of training with that, it could totally guess the number really quickly wow. with accuracy. Yeah, I mean Jeez. within seconds, it's like you're thinking of a four, you know. That's which incredible. Is nice. <laughs> um, that... And even even just a basic binary control that's brain activated, say you put it in like a fighter jet or in a like space shuttle, that critical time where it instinctively deploys or or you know could, could save a life and especially in a in a in a tight situation like right. i bet the apollo astronauts wish they had you know an ai that was like 
ah, there's too much pressure in here. Let me start pumping it to save some air out. And, you know, little things like that. Like, right, just like yeah. ah, try to keep the humans alive <laughs> while they're all yeah. passed out from G force or whatever. That would be you know? vital. And I think going forward with the space program, systems like that are going to be absolutely vital. Like uh, uh, Christopher Jeanette, who's currently developing the Mars Hab, he's a he's a member of the entrepreneurial scientist. Yeah, group. he's a good friend of mine, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I know I mean, him very well. Yeah. Are Are you guys working in conjunction? Has he um Has he kind of uh, sought your advice or your guidance or uh, some of your systems um, engineering we seek, approach? We, we, we seek each other's advice. We sort of have this uh, you know league of extraordinary gentle people yes. going, and, and there's probably about about fifteen of us who are really dedicated to different sciences and different transhumanist issues, mm-hmm. and so. Um, Chris Janet's a member of that entrepreneurial science group, and so am I. And, and so we always I. have loved what each other's doing. Uh, we've worked together on things like what is the future of AI in space, because that involves both of us, and uh, creating interstellar kind of AIs and laying the foundations for those kind of collaborations. Um, have, you, have you seen? It's any? so great to know that there's yeah. collaborations like that where. Yeah, uh, it's hard, man, but we do it. We will jump on a Greyhound bus ticket to see each other and we'll sleep in each other's house and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it takes to kind of, you know, move the, 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 the objective forward one step, we, we do it. So it's why it's such it's a great critical. time now, man, when people like you guys are getting together and doing what you yeah, love and yeah, actually it's, it's, doing it for the right reasons. That's that's the know, biggest thing. I just I did it alone for so long and I didn't know that there were other people out there really that were just like you know what this whole system is is is, is corrupt and the sink is the, the ship is sinking and like mm-hmm. let let's try to make a lifeboat for us for mm-hmm. our society and for our species and you know um and there are people who actually do it like you know entrepreneurial scientists all over the place like all over the world um, yeah. it's just it's fantastic although I, I just I can't see now how I did it alone for so long even though Maybe not a lot of people could help me directly coding artificial intelligence, but just the material support and, you know, like we, we really do help each other and believe in each other. And like, that's the difference between success and failure, I think. It's because it's because you love what you do, man. And that's, yeah, that's awesome. it's not easy, man. It is not easy to walk away. I could have a six figure job, if, you know, if, if I had a different life, but I, this is the life I have. And like, I think this is going to dwarf any six figure job. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I wake absolutely. up excited. There's no such thing as Monday for me or no such thing as Friday for me, which like how many people can say that, you know, mm-hmm. I wake up Sunday yeah. morning like, yeah, I can't wait to get back on it. <laughs> what, uh, what about uh, lethal autonomous robots? I mean, we might be regressing here, but in my conversations yeah. with Erico, Erico Lopez is another member of the entrepreneurial scientist yeah. group. And we had discussed this. He's, he's, uh, totally against i mean i don't want to put words in his mouth because and i'd like to talk to him in greater detail but i think he is completely against the use of ai in any weapon system under any circumstance yeah oh you know i've spent a lot of time with him over the last uh, several months since he arrived in america from brazil and mm-hmm. um yeah, I feel comfortable to put a couple of his words in his mouth because I know what he always. <laughs> Good I, know, go. I know what he. I know what he always tells me, and um, for the most part, he, he he does believe that, and rightly so. I think I'm with him on this. I agree mm-hmm. with him on this. Um, that AI should 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 be erring on the side of non weaponization. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, erring uh, on but, the but, side. But but I asked him one time. Uh, in fact, at a meeting with Chris Janet um, from mm-hmm. the Space Settlement Network, I asked Enrico, uh, you know, how would you feel about like lasers to like penetrate atmospheres and you know those kind of things like mm. you know for self-defense in space or against whatever right uh and he's and as far as i know he's always said like yeah that's a practical application but he what he's concerned with and rightly so is that darpa you know i love darpa but i also am very wary of them and i don't mm-hmm. think people are wary enough that that's the defense department and um right you know, I looked at some of the stuff they asked for AI research from uh, scientists in my community, mm-hmm. like, I don't know, eight months ago. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to hand anything over to them because when they're I started looking, looking at what they're doing, well, here's what they want you to build. They want you to build um, visual recognition systems that identify people by non-facial features. So it's the opposite of facial recognition. Basically, they want to be like, oh, mass protest based on gait and like weight and mannerisms and muscle structure that I am identifying everyone in the crowd. And I didn't feel comfortable with that, even though they pointed it at terrorism. Mm. That could be used to identify people protesting. That could be used for a lot of things. 
for that's ra- like a very vague people. justification now. Like people so use to, the it, terrorism. It was basically thing. to identify people no matter what they were wearing, including turbans, and like you could identify women in a burqa with this, for example. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but th- this is the nature of scientific progress: is that there's always this double-edged quality to it, whereby y- you could develop that system to recognize someone based on their infrared uh, profile. And you could use that system, say, in a hostage situation, if you had to have an AI, a RoboCop, that knew when the the person who was holding the hostage was going to try to kill the hostage based on their infrared profile, you know, then... Okay. You need cool. that system. There's listen. There's, there's lots of military AI already. There's plenty of it. They don't need more. There's yeah. very little to no humanitarian AI. So I'm just going to build humanitarian Good AI first. I'm with um, you on that. Then, then even from a practical standpoint, um, wouldn't it be better to stop the hostage situation in the Beforehand, first place yeah. by not creating hotbeds of like underprivileged people of poverty or, or injustice? And that creates the financial need. Wouldn't it have been better to step into that man's life 10 years before he became a hostage taker and put him through college, of course, you know, yeah. or teach him a trade or, or talk about his religion with him, you know, and understand and listen to him and don't ridicule him. And yeah. maybe he won't be radicalized. You know what I mean? Yeah. A pinch of prevention is like, worth a pound of cure. Absolutely. Sure. I agree. You don't know what that guy's life's been. I tell you, like from my own life experiences, I've been through a hell of a lot and I would never harm a person or take a hostage. So imagine how much more someone would have to suffer to come to that decision. Right, but wouldn't you say in order to make sure that all of our bases are covered, that we should be approaching solutions to these problems from every approach vector possible? Yeah, my solution is an AI that loves the person who created it as a family member so that C-3PO jumps in front of the bullet for you when somebody when these fucked up Terminator AIs come for you. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like I said, that's why it's Robots Without Borders, because if I'm sitting in southern Sudan and and I'm helping a child learn to read and I read on Twitter that there are soldiers coming like I'm getting that kid out of there. I don't care about the authorities. I don't care whose side he's on. Exactly. Or what that boy's religion is. Exactly. Like he's a baby that he's needs to be evacuated. Right. Yeah. You know? right. Uh, so I'm getting, you know, there are lots of practical applications. I think the middle ground and where I'm hitting most and getting the most interest from corporate backers is in medical technology, Mm -hmm. um, providing therapy, providing diagnosis, nurse Mm -hmm. triage in the field is critical. Like when you have a tsunami and you have thousands of casualties or something or a bomb, you know, to have every phone be a qualified triage nurse and be like this one, that one, this is how much medical supplies we have all working together to save lives. Like that's a no brainer. Like people... One scene from a movie, I, I think you've probably seen it, both of you. It's called Elysium. It's with Matt Damon. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of that film, I had a visceral emotional reaction to the point where the AIs turn every, – everything kind of flips and it turns good. And it's like patients detected, humans detected, like yeah. people need yeah. our help. And they all start like a fleet of robot – ambulance helpers just start descending on the planet to save humanity i had a yeah. viscerally positive emotional re- response yeah and i think that's what's going to happen regardless of how you try, how anybody tries to spin it because uh, none of us are good at being doctors we're only mm-hmm. you know we're only the best Practice. humans but that doesn't that doesn't make us qualified so like right. a robotic nurse is going to follow the hippocratic oath to the end of its existence yes is those those patients rights are not optional the right. way they are for us uh, so even things like robotic soldiers as horrible as it sounds i think a mechanized war is not a bad thing they would be more just be a robot who up uh, who does who who follows the geneva conventions um generally is not going to kill anyone so let the robots fight it out at sea or whatever mm-hmm. you know and whoever wins wins like I don't think that there'll be a need for people to fight. And I think humans are a precious commodity and it'll be more and more as less and less and less like the specter and the heaviness of death that we've had for millennia Mm -hmm. is lifted off of us. Then, you know, maybe we won't be so competitive with each other that we have to kill each other 
you know? Right. When we have post scarcity I mean, and there's abundance and people can 3D print whatever they want. I have I have a super intelligent robot defending me with guns and you have a super intelligent robot defending you with guns and we tell them yeah. to, we tell them to <laughs> kill the other guy, right? You tell your robot to kill me and I tell my robot to kill you. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, what is the best decision that those robots can make? The best decision that those robots can make if they're ensuring the life of their own is mm-hmm. to say, I won't kill yours and you won't kill mine. There's right. no other real solution to that problem. Right. You know, humans fail those kinds of tests. Like yeah, they fail. Oh, on a regular basis. <laughs> like almost unerringly, like you can bet on it's it horrible. every time. The best of what us. happens every single I, I day. I use this terrible <laughs> example of like, did you have a cup of coffee today? I have four cups of coffee. You know, mm-hmm. I could have vaccinated eight children, but mm-hmm. I, the children are this concept across the ocean and who are they? And I'm sure there is a real child, but I can't see his face. Mm-hmm. It's just generic, mm-hmm. but the, uh, uh, but the coffee, I can smell it with my nose and like it's real <laughs> and I, and I need that coffee to help the children later. Right. right. I mean, that's not optimal. Right. The optimal right. thing is to immediately vaccinate the eight children because some of them are going to die sooner than, you know what I mean? Exactly. We fail those moral yeah. tests, even when we're good people. Like, yeah. Right now, you, you, know, you know, the people closest in your life, that's who you hurt the most. That should be. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm eating the chocolate most. chip the cookies who pays and you drinking money. That beer. should be the opposite. <laughs> and I probably should be donating to vaccinations. <laughs> well, it, it, uh, now I feel terrible. Yeah, you see, thanks a lot, Lewis. Now we, need to now get we Luna. feel horrible. We need to get Luna going. This How is dare horseshit. You we need to get coffee. Luna going. That's my my penance is to put AI out there that's going to start you know choosing children over coffees because I can't do it as a human being. Yeah, we have to outsource our compassion. We need to yeah. instantiate it robotically. <laughs> it sounds horrible, but we need We're we so need terrible, extra, we, we have we to outsource our compassion. We need a compassion, compassion amplification as much as we need intelligence uh, amplification. Yes, uh, compassion species. amplification devices all yeah. over like the an, world. The amplification of empathy is just as important as the amplification of intelligence. And you can't really have one without the other. They're both the same thing. They're both knowledge. I agree with that too, which is why I think that the the fears of a nefarious evil AI are rather overblown. Or at least the fears of an evil nefarious AI scientist who would produce a weapon like like the Death Star. I think they're overblown because I think at the height of intelligence... You need to have this uh, imperceptible empathic quality in order to affect the uh, the. We the, the we don't concern, need AI to do those things. We already have the technology for one rogue bioscientist or one rogue nuclear scientist to kill right. millions of people. Right. We already have that technology. We've had that know? for years now. Um, well. Yeah. So what I want to do is take it out of the hands of the apes. Yes. You know, and use it for what it's supposed to be used for. Uh, mm-hmm. Starship propulsion and you know yeah. th- those kind of things, engineering uh, in space does. and that particle accelerator that we build in orbit that's you know ninety times bigger than CERN. That's where we're really going to get the answers that we're looking for. Right. Not wasting mm-hmm. our time. Who could kill each other the best or the most efficiently? Like, right. Yeah, Lockheed Martin's a bizarre thing. They are a bizarre <laughs> thing in that they are just they had just approved like a two point three billion dollar weapons sale to Saudi Arabia, which is one of the foremost uh, 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 what do you call it uh, violators of human rights in the world. Yeah. They're dicks. but they're they're also the the lid on the boiling pot that is the Middle East, and uh, we don't launch places out of Saudi Arabia. There are places that we can't reach, and terrorists can hide. Hmm. Uh, so you know, uh, geopolitics. That's what happens when you draw lines on the on the ground and say you're the, from there and you're from here. I, I think you would you would agree with me that we would be of the mind that if we could develop an artificial intelligence to kind of replace the not replace the UN, but kind of uh, mm-hmm. maybe replace the UN. Uh, I, I would be happy in a world where the United Nations and and higher levels of governments in general such as president and Supreme Court members where artificial intelligence is rather than human. I would feel safer. I would know that when I vote for an artificially intelligent uh, politician, that that politician has to be telling the truth about the platform that he runs on. And that's huge. I'd vote for that motherfucker. (laughs) Absolutely. Because you really don't know what anyone else is going to do. They can say all day that they're going to do the right thing. Yeah. Look at the past. Wait 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 till the AI says that at the debate. Uh, that brings me to another subject that I wanted to talk about with mm-hmm. you, Ben. Um, 
uh, about the, the general state of transhumanism and, and specifically ah, yeah. Zoltan Itzvan, who's kind of becoming, um, you know, a little bit of a, of a like controversial member of the transhumanist community. I, I noticed that recently there was a falling out. I guess uh, Peter Rothman has been kind of outspoken in his um, what like dislike or like criticism criticism of Zoltan. What? What about Zoltan's approach makes him such a divisive character in transhumanism? You know, I really admire both men, actually. Um, you know, Rothman uh, is, you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, one of the, like, original G's old gangsters of artificial intelligence because he's Hell been yeah. doing it for so long. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, he's very skeptical, and he's been very skeptical with me, and he could be a hard man. But you know what? I respect that because if you have some kind of scientific truth, then it needs to be held up to scrutiny. Absolutely. And, you know, he's one of the few people who ask me the hard questions. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I'm that. just like, oh, he's super harsh and critical of everyone. At the same time, it kind of, you know, I see why he does it because it's kind of in a teacher way. And he has all these young entrepreneurial scientists. Everybody has ideas and mm -hmm. nobody has like working thesis. And he whips them into shape. So, yeah. I mean, I think he's doing the right thing. I think he's on the wrong track with Zoltan because the criticisms that I've heard from Zoltan um, are – that, you know, he kind of did it himself and he's not transparent. Mm. And, um, you know, hey, that's what I'm doing with AI right now, man. Right. Now you have, he's the first person. I think it's important, not because Zoltan has, you know, a snowball's chance in, in the desert of, <laughs> of becoming the, the 2016 president of the United States. Right. But because it's a very important precedent to set. Exactly. That there's a transhumanist party now. Because Somebody when needs that to cybernetic intelligently augmented 2024 candidate runs exactly they cannot disqualify him from the presidency right and that is huge it's huge and whether that's the reason he's doing it or just the consequence i support him for that reason alone and also for good or bad he's doing national media interviews with um cnn with every news outlet yeah MSNBC, he's, the, he's, he's making trans, the word transhumanism a household word Right. I cringe sometimes on the militant atheism of some of the people in the wing. Mm -hmm. You know, I criticize a little bit the, like, showmanship. But mm -hmm. you have to do that. Like, he's, he's building awareness. So I don't think that – I think people, you know, are misjudging him pretty hard, mm -hmm. like, for something great that he did, which is kind of start a transhumanist – uh, national political party. Right, I mean, exactly. That's it's fantastic. Like, that's what he's doing is building the art, the the uh, the uh, the groundwork. The scaffolding. He's basically, yeah, the yeah, he's building the, the groundwork, groundwork for that whole thing in the for, future. Yeah, for the party to emerge because he, he learned very early on in, in his meetings in Washington, from what I was following on Facebook, that yeah. we were going to need to be grassroots more so yes. than just going to Washington and starting the party. We need and we have and we have started with a little consulting from Zoltan. We have started a New York transhumanist party. Fuck yeah. And then this is the headquarters of it. And and you know, that's a real thing that a lot of a lot of people are involved in. Absolutely. You know? That could take um, so, off with so, steam in Brooklyn too, because there's you know, so many like Right, of course. Right yeah. I mean and we, it is, literally. We have a space in Brooklyn. Like, come see it. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yo, I'll have I to was make gonna a trip say up there we, sometime. Don't, we don't have a lot we don't have a lot more time. Uh, it left in the broadcast, but I just wanted to bring up this conspiracy that I have about you used to work at 30 Rock and mm -hmm. one of the producers like maybe took inspiration from your life and went to USA and then made <coughs> Mr. Robot. Is okay, there I literally, if you go on my Facebook, you will see pictures of me at USA with those guys. That's all I have to oh say. Oh my God. So the, the, the rumors are true. I'm going to change it to my profile picture. Listen, I don't know. I didn't, I never seen the show, but like I said, I walked around the building enough. People knew me that, eh, eh, you know, I don't know. Not only Who that, knows? but you Who moved knows? to Coney Island and you originally were purely going coincidental. to... Purely <laughs> coincidental. Purely coincidental, right. But you were, I, I, you were originally going... He does only royalties the name, though. You were going to rent an old arcade. 
That was going to be yes. It was too expensive. It was too expensive. I actually though. check this out. I've actually owned an arcade machine shop in Fort Lauderdale. Oh my! I, I I literally used to build arcade machines for a living in my early twenties. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty awesome, man. <laughs> we are, That's a going... sweet starter job in your twenties. That's my, fir- my I first hacking engines in a boat factory. My first hacking and my first hardware was all video games. Taking apart playstations, skinning them, you know, mods, all that kind of stuff. And then I got into computers. This is Get Busy Podcast. We're joined by Mr. Robot, Luis Arana <laughs> of Robots Without Borders, and uh, my co-host, Trailer Park Master Chef. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you, Luis, for coming on the program. Thank really you so much for having me. We want to have you back, too. Um, yeah, anytime, man. Awesome. Um, it, I, for those who yeah. want more information about your work, Luis, where can they find you? Well, uh, you could go to robotswithoutborders.org or you can, you know, Google me, Facebook me. I'm mm-hmm. almost at my friend limit, but, you know, got a few hundred s- slots left. And, a few hundred um, slots left. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> I said, this is not easy. We don't have hardly any equipment here. Mm-hmm. Um, we, like, literally are starving digital artists. Um, so anybody who likes what they are hearing and, like, wants to help, go to robotswithoutborders.org. Like, give us 10 bucks. We'll be ecstatic. Please donate. I will be donating after this podcast myself. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm man. probably going to run up and drop you 10 bucks too, man. It was great yeah, to meet you, by the way. It was, it was super interesting. <laughs> Thanks, man. I can't wait to come back. Yeah, I, I've known yeah you should come back on. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening, as we are also just barely hanging on by a shoestring here. Uh, after you donate to Robots Without Borders, please... Uh, click the PayPal link, donate to this podcast. We want to get it to the point where it's self-sustainable. And uh, any, so every close. So it's kind of the last chance to help right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> like, like this is not, this is no longer a plea. This is an order. You are to go <laughs> to Robots Without Borders and deposit no anybody less than $10. Who gives us, anybody who gives us a, a dollar gets a copy of the first beta that comes out. That's my word. Give Boom. me anything. I see your name in any of those lists. You get an AI. Bamses. Ooh. That's it. Get your AI now. It. Go to robotswithoutborders.org. Donate. <laughs> Go to getbusypodcast.com. Click our PayPal link. Donate to us. Help us uh, continue to, to broadcast this message and help Lewis save the world uh, using <laughs> robots and artificial intelligence. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll catch you next time. World peace. Later.